Hello, I'm Mary Ito, and welcome to the CRAM podcast. CRAM is an acronym for Communicating Research and More, which is what we try and do on this podcast. A lot of exciting research and groundbreaking ideas never actually reach the public, but they have the potential to change the way we think and act. You know, I like to think that I'm a pretty rational person, that generally my decisions make sense and that there's evidence or at least a good reason for making those decisions. And doesn't everyone think this way? I mean, that they're fairly rational. I'm sure you do. I mean, who would think that they themselves make terrible, irrational decisions most of the time that make no sense? And yet, we all know people who we think are irrational and make terrible decisions. Take the pandemic, for example. It divided people into camps, the rational thinkers and the irrational thinkers. To me, that experience raised a lot of questions about how we behave. Just who is a rational person? And who gets to decide? What constitutes rational thinking? Duncan McIntosh is a professor of philosophy at Dalhousie University in Halifax. He has thought a lot about this topic, rationally, of course. And in fact, he teaches a course called The Theory of Rational Decision, and he joins us. Hello, Duncan. Hi, Mary. How are you? I'm great, thanks. Um, so this is, a, I find it a fascinating topic, and um, I've had lots of conversations <laughs> with people leading up to today. Let me start off first, and my whole notion that most people believe that they're rational most of the time, would you agree with that or not? Yeah. Uh, it's a default assumption in the theory of rational decision that most people are rational most of the time. Uh, so it, something would have to go wrong before for you to not be rational, more or less, plus or minus. Okay, good. I'm glad that, that I'm correct on that first point. And then now as far as um, sort of rational and irrational behavior goes, what do you think happened during the pandemic? You know, because it really split people, right, into these camps. I don't know what it was like in your circle, but in mine, people were obsessional about information. Everybody had read the same stories, but had different takes on it. So some people would be skeptical about a, a, something that they read. Other people would be credulous. Uh, it, was, I, it was a bit surprising to me how different the takes were on that. And I think people learned a lot about how science works over the course of this pandemic, because I don't think they'd ever watched scientific knowledge unfold in its development before. And I think people had to learn that it's a process. And uh, the information you get is, is going to change. So I think that may explain why it is that we got such differences of opinion early on, but emerged with more or less a consensus. Well, you know what? Yeah, it makes me think you're right. I mean, even when people were given the same, let's say, scientific information about vaccines, for example, it could have been interpreted in very different ways. And so yeah. I'm assuming that you know, each person is bringing their whole lifetime experience up to that point into that decision, right, that they make about the vaccine. Absolutely. And people would lens this through different prior perspectives. So if you tend to be somebody who is suspicious of big government, and now there's this pretext for everybody having to put a drug in their body, you're going to be suspicious of the vaccine. If you're somebody who believes in the value of big government, believes in science as an institution for the development of knowledge, rather than, say, the Bible, then you're going to be more okay with a scientist telling you that you have to get a vaccine. But if you're on the other side of all of that, if you're skeptical of science, if you think there are other forms of knowledge than science, better forms, it's going to be different. So I can see how people's political backgrounds, their religious backgrounds are going to affect how they think about this. Yeah, and their past experiences. So then isn't, yeah. isn't that just a perfect example then to illustrate the point that people who we might think are irrational, no, they believe they are making a rational decision even though perhaps the science doesn't necessarily back them up. 100%. Um, Most people who study the theory of rational belief formation would agree that what it's rational to do with a given piece of evidence depends on what beliefs you hold prior to receiving the evidence, because people will, will take that evidence to be confirmatory of their prior beliefs, or they'll try to make it consistent with their prior beliefs. So we start, if we start out with a different belief set, we'll get to different conclusions from the same new information. We're not necessarily being irrational. Now, we could talk about the origins of that initial belief set. We could ask, for instance, whether or not belief sets that originate in religious instruction are fully rational or 
the opposite belief sets that originate purely in scientific instruction, are they fully rational? But once you've got some beliefs, that's going to affect what a rational decision would be about them going forward. Wow. See, so I, to me, this is really tricky, sort of slippery ground, right? Because then yeah. who is a rational person? Like, how do we decide who gets to decide? Right. So I said that depending on your prior beliefs, that will affect yeah. what beliefs you form after having had evidence. But the, th the theory of rationality and philosophy generally is kind of premised on the idea and the hope that there is a way to assess all beliefs for brute rationality. So we could go back and take the prior beliefs of some people and see whether or not those beliefs would survive closer examination using philosophical techniques, the techniques of rational decision theory. And some probably won't, and some, some would. Okay, so how does that work? Give me an example how we can, how we can put that into play. Uh, suppose you believe in God because of miracles. And suppose you think that if God exists, then you should do whatever it says in the Bible. Well, now we can go back and say, all right, is miracles a good justification for believing in God? Is the best explanation of a miracle that God did it? And now we can use the theory of good explanation, born in logic and science, to evaluate that. And the answer would be no. The claim that some miraculous event happened, that the best explanation of that is God, is a problematic claim. The monster Why? Itself. Why? Because our principle called Occam's Razor, which says that in choosing between two possible explanations of a fact, always choose the simplest one. And the reason that's the right principle is because the fact that you're trying to explain is also supposed to be evidence of the correctness of the explanation. So suppose you're trying to explain my gray hair. A natural explanation would be, well, Duncan's older, and older people get gray hair. But here's another explanation. He's king of a Middle Eastern country, fleeing his enemies who are trying to assassinate him, disguising himself as a university professor by day. He has this entourage who lives under the Arctic Circle. Now, they both explain why I have gray hair, but one has way too many facts associated with it. The evidence of his gray hair is good evidence of his age, but not good evidence of all that other stuff. So the simpler explanation would be the better one. As David Hume pointed out that saying that God did it is always the most complicated explanation you could give, because God's supposed to be infinitely knowledgeable, infinitely powerful, infinitely good. So to believe that God is the explanation commits you to believing infinitely many things. Now imagine how much evidence you'd have to have to be justified in believing that. Any explanation will be simpler than that. So the God explanation can never be the right one. It's always the least likely thing to be true, and it's always the most complicated thing. Oh, gosh. It, it's, it's so interesting because a lot of people would feel that is the simplest explanation, right? That it's God, because God wraps everything into itself. But yet you're saying because it is everything, that's why it's complicated. That's right. Mm. It sounds simple until you, until you get into the moving parts. And do you realize just right. how much you've had to buy into to accept that explanation? Yeah. Okay. So let's just go back then to um, what has been agreed upon um, as who is a rational person. So what counts as being a rational person? Uh, rationality has two parts. One is rationality in which beliefs you have, and the other is rationality in which actions you do. And in terms of beliefs, it's generally thought that a person is rational in their beliefs if their beliefs are guided by evidence. So if you are responsive to evidence in the beliefs you had. And in terms of what actions you do, that's a little more complicated. The main theory is this. A rational person does those actions she believes will bring about what she wants. This is sometimes called means-ends rationality or instrumental rationality. A rational person takes what she believes to be the means to the ends that she desires. Okay. Let's just talk about that first part. Um, the rational person is acting on evidence, right? Now, we mm -hmm. just discussed the fact that people who we might think are being irrational are acting on the evidence that they believe in, right. given their past experiences, their past lives, et cetera, right? So what kind of evidence yeah. are we talking about when philosophers talk about evidence? Right. Are they talking about uh, that kind of evidence or are they talking about some other kind of external, more objective sort of evidence? No, I think, I think everybody agrees about what evidence is. It's what your eyes tell you, what your sense organs tell you, I, I suppose it gets more complicated when we ask whether or not what other people tell me is evidence. A rational person will tend to trust the people around them. It's, it's, we, we couldn't have knowledge unless we were generally trusting of what other people say to us. So that would count as evidence, uh, at least to some degree for most people. And that would explain again why it is that perfectly reasonable people could disagree about things like whether a vaccine's a good thing. 
They live in different social communities. They're told different things. People they trust give them different information. Okay. So the evidence part of it is not really that clear cut, right? That's why we have differences among people and whether things are rational or not. That's a good question. Suppose I say something to you and you say, well, it must be true because Duncan told me. And then somebody might say, well, what makes you trust Duncan? Let's go take a look at Duncan. And we ask, does he have a vested interest in this? Has he got a stake in it? Might he hold this belief for some reason other than that it's true? Does he have good evidence for it? And so on. So keep tracing it back and back and back and see whether or not his trustworthiness stands up. Okay. And then and what? You're not. saying if you, if you pass that litmus test? Then, then, then that's good evidence coming from you. Is that what you're saying? Wow, yeah, that's a, a lot of, of work. Oh, <laughs> that's absolutely. a lot of work. Absolutely. And it's, it's hard for the public to do that. Like you hear a talking yeah. head on TV and they disagree with another talking head. Who are you to believe? That's right. Who, who should you believe? Who's I mean, who's going to do... We, who's going to do all that homework every single time, right? So we yeah. every day in the course of, of one 24-hour day, the number of decisions that we make, right? Some can be small, some can be big. We make right. a decision though on them. We make a decision based on either no, little, or a lot of evidence. Right. Well, there's a couple of shortcuts here. There's actually a field on this, and it's, it, it tries to answer the question, how should a layperson decide who's an expert? So you're watching people on CNN, for instance. And so here are the kinds of things you might look for. Is the person a good listener? Suppose they're not. Then how likely is it that somebody who knows a fact would have told it to them? You know, they'd be impervious. Consider Donald Trump, a terrible listener, a terrible listener. It's almost inconceivable that he could actually know anything. You know, if there was an expert (laughs) in the room, he wouldn't be able to uptake it. Uh, Or do they uh, give um, justifications for what they say? Or do they just say them? Do they just pontificate? People who actually know things can give justifications for their views. People who actually know things can give a larger theory of which their view is a part so that the whole thing makes sense as a worldview. Uh, people who uh, actually know things usually have credentials. So they're, you know, they're trained at a good university or they have a job whose job it is to find things out. We have knowledge institutions in our society and they tend to work for research labs, universities, uh, Uh, journalism outlets, credible journalism outlets. So there are all kinds of ways to tell whether or not somebody's an expert. What is their training? What's the justification they offer for their belief? Do they seem like the kind of the person, kind of person to whom truth could be told? Could they hear it? Could they listen to it? Mm -hmm. Okay. So, so that's sort of the first part of rational decision-making or the rational person. And then you said the second part involves actions. Right. And it's whether the person is acting in a way that they end up getting what they want. A rational person does what she believes will get her what she wants. Wow, that seems really self-centered. <laughs> right. Um, hmm. So how does that work? Okay, give me an example of that. Well, your, your concern is that that sounds like a very self-centered way to make decisions. But people could want anything at all. I might want the welfare of my family, the welfare of my countrymen. I might want global peace. I might want to cure cancer. The point is that there are things that I'm in favor of or that that I would like to see happen. And a rational person, all other things equal, takes the means to those ends. Now, then we can talk about whether or not the things that people want are all equally valuable or valid. Are there some wants that it's inappropriate to have, irrational to have? But all other things equal, a rational person would take the means to her ends. How, how long has the, like, where did this definition come from? This, this one became very, very popular with, again, David Hume in the uh, 1800s. Right. I mean, it was known long before him, but he's the one who said, this is all there is to the rationality of making decisions about how to act. That's also called practical rationality. Lots of people have disagreed with him and said, no, there's a lot more to it than that. And we can talk about that. Okay. Yeah. So how about you? Do you like that definition or do you disagree with it? The great beauty of it is suppose you're trying to talk somebody into doing something you think is a a better way, a better thing to do, like on moral basis or something like that. Okay. You're going to make more traction with this person if you can show them that given what they already care about and given their current beliefs or beliefs that you can get them to adopt by giving them evidence, they would agree that they should try to bring about that thing you're in favor of. So it has the advantage that 
it gives you a starting point and the hope of getting them to where you want to want them to go rather than just saying flat out, you know, what you desire is crazy or stupid, irrational or evil. You're, you're in favor then of this definition, generally speaking, is that right? Of David Hume's definition of d- rational decision-making, but okay. I With, with two I, modifications, I, I, but oh, with two mo- oh, oh, well, because you were saying that there are a lot of people who actually don't right. agree with him. And I'd like to hear about that. Okay. So there are at least two issues about Hume's position. The first is, are your desires directly reasons to do actions or only indirectly? So a modern Humean named David Gautier said that they're only indirectly reasons. So here, here are two versions of Hume's theory. Theory one, a rational person does what she thinks will get her what she wants. Theory two, a rational person first adopts the character traits, the having of which would most benefit her, and then does what those character traits say to do. And Gautier argues that the most advantageous character traits to have are those of a trustworthy, law-abiding person. Why? Because then other people will respect you, obey the law around you, be nice to you, and you'll get more of what you want, you'll get more of your desire satisfied than you would if you just directly went for what would satisfy them. So first become a certain kind of person, that attracts certain opportunities to you from the world, and in the long run that means that many more of your desires will get satisfied. But only because you first used your desires to choose character traits and then use those to choose actions, rather than using your desires directly to choose actions. So in this way, Gautier hopes to show even the Humean that it's rationally obligatory to accept certain moral constraints on your conduct, the ones that involve having good character and attracting opportunities to you from the world. Yeah, isn't that making quite a big assumption about people? That if I'm trustworthy, they'll be nice to me? No, that they're even going... Well, that, but that, that they're even going to know to adopt these certain characteristics, that that's a good idea. Yeah. So Gautier thinks that basically we train people from birth to be like this. Ah. Uh, we, we, we train them to adopt the character traits that it will most advantage their desires to have. And he also thought okay. that we're pretty good at telling who's like this. You know, you see mm-hmm. somebody on the street, you can tell whether they mean you harm You Mm -hmm. meet somebody and you can tell whether they're a trustworthy person. There's all kinds of cues that we use as shortcuts. Of course, if we couldn't do that, then there'd be no point in going through this step Mm -hmm. because it Mm -hmm. couldn't advantage you in any way. Right. Uh, The other thing that a lot of philosophers hope is true is that it's possible to, to offer a rational criticism of people's desires. Not all desires are equally rational. Now, how to do that is controversial. You know, we think that... Humans are a kind of animal, and we think that for each animal, there's such a thing as a good life for that animal, good life for a wolf, good life for a rabbit. There's such a thing as a good life for a human. All right. Can we make sense of a good life for a human involving counting blades of grass, killing everybody, eating themselves? Uh, A third possibility is this. A A desire is okay as long as, given everybody else's desires, everybody's desires have a shot at being satisfied. Some desires just will not mix into the bunch. And that's arguably a point against having that desire. Your desire just cannot be reconciled with those of anybody else in the world. That seems Mm. like maybe you want to rethink your desire. Just because it's unique. Because it's oppositional to everybody else's. Oh, Oh, not just that it's unique. It's oppositional. Yeah, that's important. Right. Okay, got it. Got it. Right. Mm Mm-hmm. Yeah. Um, I mean, we could get into laws and that's, you know, criminal and, but accounting sure. blades of grass, of course, yeah, that's not criminal. You could just, you, people might say that's a waste of time, but again, that's yeah. all part of the good life definition, isn't it? Yes. Is that is a way to lead a good life? Exactly right. Now that's a very, that's a, a classic example in the literature, but See, the recent discovery of neuroatypicality might yeah. challenge that example because neuro, neuroatypical people might think that's a great life. I want to know exactly how many blades of grass I've got on my lawn. You know, that's just me. I'm different. And and what could I say? All right. <laughs> Fill your boots. You know, well, this is true because if you're not hurting anyone, right? Right. And it's your business and you can still, let's say, support yourself. It's not like you're depending on anyone else. You, right. Why not? If you want to go ahead and cr- you know count every blade of grass, this is very true. Yeah, yeah, that's a tough one uh, to argue against. 
Hmm. We were talking about things that could possibly make it objectively correct or incorrect to desire yeah. something. Right. So here's another one. Uh, some philosophers have argued that it's impossible to desire something unless you can represent it as good. This is called desiring something under the guise of the good. So that means that you're offering your desire as one that you could defend as something that it's good to desire. And that connects us with this whole other kind of, of argument. W what is it that could make something good to desire? But as soon as you think, yeah, I, I, I should only desire something if I can argue that it's good to desire. Now the burden is, is on you to show that it's a good thing to desire. What's so good about that? What's so good about counting blades of grass? What's so good about killing everybody? What's so good about eating yourself? And that's practically to admit that there's a standard other than you that determines whether your desires are rational. And that standard is, can you justify them? What do you think of that? I think that's a really brilliant argument. Now, then there's the question, what would count as a justification? Hold it, hold it. Let, just a second. <laughs> Let's go back. Yeah. You think it's a brilliant argument? Yep. Why? Well, it seems right to me. I, I would find it very hard to desire something if I thought it was horrible. Like if I thought nothing could be said for it. It's indefensible. But the thing is, I mean, yeah, you you want it because you think it's good. But I may that's, think it's horrible, right? Yes. That, that's the whole... I mean, it goes back to the, the whole idea that we believe we make rational decisions. That's really what it goes back to, right? Right, right. We want it because we think it's good for us. Yeah. Uh, let me see if I can make this. Uh, uh, by the way, I agree with everything you said. And I think it's consistent <laughs> with what I'm saying. We want something okay. because we think it's good. Yeah. Uh, now, for us, in some sense. Now, for you, us, we've already yeah. agreed that that I can want other people's welfare. That could be amongst my wants. So my wants aren't yep. necessarily yep. self-focused or yep. selfish. Yeah. And, and hold it, on, let's just be clear too. Can we just be clear? So yeah. just because we think it's good for us, it may not necessarily be good for us, but we think Absolutely. it is. That's right. And I mean, it's, and some there's some cases where it's clear how it is that it's possible to rationally talk somebody out of something. Somebody's thirsty, they want to drink from that water. They, th they think that drinking from that cup will be good for them. But then you point out, no, no, it contains arsenic. Don't do it. And now they'll change their mind about whether or not it's good to drink from that cup. So that would be one example. If they're misinformed about some fact about the thing they desire, then correcting them on that fact might make them change the desire. Uh, there's something else that's relevant here, too. In, in Hume's time, it was thought that a reason to do something is that you want to do it, you desire to do it. But in more modern times, people think, no, no. You wanting to do something is the thing you have to give a reason for. So that you desire something isn't the reason. It's the thing for which you need to give reasons. And sometimes the fact that you desire something is a good reason to do it. Like if it's my turn to pick the movie, then the fact that I desire this movie is a good reason. But suppose we're trying to decide whether or not we should give money to this homeless person on the street. And right. I say, I'm not doing it. And, and you say, well, why? And I say, well, I don't want to. That's not a justification. That's just a smart alecky answer. What I would have to say is because he'll just buy alcohol with it, or I already gave, or I can't afford it, or there are other people who need it more than than him, uh, or he wronged me. You know, you, you you have to give some reason for your desire. Your desire itself doesn't count. It doesn't count for beings. So there are ways to flip the Humean approach, which says it's all based on desires, because then you say, well, they're subjective. How can you possibly criticize them? But this modern approach flips it and says, desires are the things you need good reasons to have. They are not themselves reasons, um, which I think is also yeah. a brilliant argument. <laughs> yeah. Like it changes your whole way right. of thinking about it, right? It, it does. It's just not good enough, right, to say, well, I want this. Right. Well, why? Why, why do you want it? It has to be right. based on something that you can explain, right? Yeah. Suppose hmm. somebody says, you know, why, why do you want to vote? Why are you voting for Donald Trump? Because I want to. Terrible answer. What you have to say is, here's what makes him vote worthy. Mm -hmm. That justifies mm -hmm. you in wanting to vote for him. And then you might say, well, you know, he's going to shake up the swamp. He's going to drain the swamp. He'll, uh, he'll save this country from the Chinese you, or whatever. So you know what? Let's just say, yeah. So you say you want to vote for Donald Trump and this person has, uh, has, has a reason. 
for wanting to vote for Donald Trump, and you disagree and find that reason ludicrous, listening to that reason, you just think it's a sure. ludicrous reason, right? That still doesn't mean, again, going back to the fact, like, is this person making a rational decision or not? He is. He is making a rational decision, right? Not could according well to you. Be, could very well be, given their background experience and reasonable exactly. assumptions. Exactly. Yeah. Very well be. Now, then there's the question whether it'll survive examination. You know, now we sit down and talk. We're, okay. Okay. Mm -hmm. So what reason do you have for voting for him? Let's see whether the reason stands up. And that person can say the same to me. What reason do you have for voting against Trump? Let's see if your reasons stand up. Has has the thinking about rational decision making, has it changed a lot, like over centuries or decades or, you know, I mean, over time? Has it changed a lot or, or not really fundamentally? Uh, on the face of it, it's changed a lot. Oh. The, the following famously used to be offered as an argument for why there are seven planets. They were only they only knew about seven planets, right? Because there are seven holes in the human head. Now, <laughs> this seems preposterous now. Preposterous, but well, there was a time when that would make complete sense. So I would call that progress. <laughs> <laughs> There's a famous argument in the philosophy of religion uh, invented by a philosopher named Blaise Pascal. And Pascal recognized that there may not be really, really good evidence to believe in God, but he still thought it was rational to do so. And he gave this amazing argument called Pascal's Wager. And the argument basically comes down to this. If you believe in God, wonderful things could happen. So you should do it. Like you could go to heaven, save yourself from hell, and so on. Well, we would now think like that's the same as saying you should buy a lottery ticket because you could win $36 million. But we now know that you need to ask at least two further questions before doing this. What are the odds of winning and how much does it cost to play? All right. Okay. So let's go back to Pastel. What are the odds of getting into heaven? Well, that depends. Does God exist? Okay, and, and Pascal himself admits there's zero evidence that God exists. Under those circumstances, what are the odds that he exists? Zero. So what's the infinite reward, reward of heaven? It's infinity times zero, which is zero. So if it costs you anything at all to have this belief, you shouldn't do it. And it does cost you. You know, you can't eat meat on Fridays. You can't swear, <laughs> drink, smoke. You have to do what it says in the Bible. So... The point I'm making is that, yes, we've learned that to make practical decisions, you don't just ask, how great is the possible outcome of the decision? You ask, what are the odds of that outcome occurring? And you ask, what does it cost you to take that path? I would argue that this is a discovery of rational decision theory in the last 300 years, that you, you have to add those two things to the equation. So that's new. Well, you know what? That's such a nice, neat package. But unfortunately, that's not the way humans operate, right? Mm. They don't think like that. Um, so millions and millions and millions of people believe there is evidence for God, right? Mm -hmm. In their lives, look at these miracles, look at this, look at, you know, I'm blessed. Uh, I believe in God. And and then there's even, I guess, well, this is probably part of the, the this argument that what does it cost me, right? Well, it really costs me nothing to believe in God just in case there is a heaven then I get to go there, right? right? It costs me nothing. So why don't I believe in God? So two things about this. First, you're absolutely right that lots of people would not accept the assumption that there's no evidence that God exists. Right. Right. So Pascal was just trying to persuade people who didn't think there was any evidence. He was trying uh -huh. to say, like, even if you think there's no evidence that God exists, you'd be crazy not to believe in him. Here's my reason. And he gave this argument, right? Right. right. I claim that his, that his reason had two holes in it. And it, it took a couple of hundred years for us to see that there was a deficiency there. But suppose you did think there was all kinds of evidence for God's existence. Then it's a whole different equation. Now the odds of his existing are not zero and multiply that by the possible reward of heaven. And arguably that would overcome all possible cost. You know, if there's any chance at all that God actually exists, given that the possible reward is infinite, when you multiply those odds right. by infinity, you get infinity. Yep. And so, you know, it's worth anything, worth absolutely anything. No matter what it costs you, you should do it. But does it cost you? Well, it depends. Beliefs matter because they affect action. Religious beliefs matter because people behave differently because of them. If you believe in the Christian God and living in, the, in accord with the example that Christ set for us, then you're supposed to turn your other cheek to enemies and be kind to strangers and love everybody, even if they've committed you know, small moral sins. You're not supposed to use violence and so on. Uh, 
So there's, there is a way that you have to walk the walk, not just talk the talk, if you're going to have a belief. That's why we care about what people believe. And for some people, the religious lifestyle would be a benefit. But for some people, it'll be a cost. If you are a woman and you have to live in a fundamentalist culture, where women are basically second-class citizens, put on a pedestal in one way, forbidden from doing certain things in another, there's an enormous cost. You know, you can't have the profession you want, don't have the same reproductive rights as in a non-religious culture, you're liable to certain kinds of violence, all under a religious justification. On the other hand, uh, there are lots of things good about a religious lifestyle. Like if it says no drinking, well, alcohol is bad for you. No smoking, smoking's bad for you. No swearing and yelling, those are all things that are bad for you. You know, they cause arteriosclerosis. Uh, early to rise, uh, early to bed, makes a person healthy, wealthy, and wise. Those are all religious sayings, and you probably have a good life in certain ways from that. So it's going to vary from person to person, whether or not that's a rational calculation. So the, the sense I get is that you believe humans are mostly rational, right? Yep. You, you believe we are. And, and do, do many philosophers agree with you? You, you don't have to count them all, but just generally speaking. Yeah, that's right. <laughs> yeah. That <guy. laughs> There's that guy, yeah. <laughs> the theory of rationality has a descriptive part, like any scientific theory. You know, I would predict that a person will do this, and a normative part. I think a person ought to do this. Yeah. And it's generally thought that it can't be that people have a duty to do something that's impossible for them to do. So that means the normative part has to be consistent with people can, what people can actually do. So if a decision theorist goes around saying that people should do something nobody ever does, that's good evidence that their theory is wrong. And that's partly why I think it must be true that if a theory of rationality is correct, most of the time people will obey it. If they couldn't, they would have an excuse for not obeying the theory, and the theory would be wrong. It wouldn't really bind them. Uh, it's also a bit like disease. We define disease as something that's not typical, atypical. So in a way, it's bizarre to talk about the disease of old age. It's not a disease. Mm -hmm. It's the natural mm -hmm. course of the human life. The measles is a disease. And by definition, it's got to be short term or rare or exceptional or deviate from some norm. Likewise, irrationality. It's got to be the exception, not the rule. Just like disease is the exception, not the rule. So in that sense, most people most of the time are rational. Do you think the act of living is rational or irrational? We, we don't think about it. Just the mere act of living, isn't beautiful. it irrational? This is a beautiful question. So if I say that most people are rational most of the time, what about the stuff that we just do from habit or the stuff that we just do because or the stuff that we just do because we never thought about not doing it, like getting up every morning? What about the stuff that we do as a biological inevitability? Aren't these all examples of people being either irrational or non-rational? And what does that do to the claim that people are most of the time rational? Exactly. Exactly. Right. right. And I want to distinguish between irrational and non-rational. Oh, okay. So a lot mm. of our life might be non-rational, like digestion, micturation, respiration. It, it's, these are just processes that we mm. engage in. Mm -hmm. Rationality is something that, that the, the term speaks to something that we might say of a belief or something we might say of a desire or something we might say of an action. But it's not something that we might say of digestion or respiration. Or getting up every morning? Getting up in the morning. I mean, you, you, you know, mm. your brain rises on, uh, you know, when, the, when, the diurnally, right? We've, we've got these circadian mm -hmm. rhythms and, mm -hmm. and they are neither rational or irrational. Although I expect you could, there's some things that, that could be called evolutionarily rational. That is to say, there is a good organism and advantaging reason why our species has these characteristics. That raises the interesting question whether something other than an individual, a person, can count as rational. Can a species count as rational? Or can a species trait count as rational? And I, I can see arguments for that. It's good, for instance, that we tend to want to protect our young because otherwise our genes can't reproduce into the next generation. Yeah, not so that us. would be evolutionarily rational, right? Yeah. Right, 
Yeah. yeah. Wow. Okay. <laughs> you know, it's it's interesting. Yeah. I mean, you're very persuasive. Oh, well, thank very, you. Yeah, you're. I'm very not sure I believe pers- anything I just said, but that's that's great. Well, oh no, I don't say I that. Everything I said. What's that? Yeah, don't yeah, don't say that because <laughs> <I'm not> gonna- <laughs> that sounds totally irrational. Um, but no, you are because I think, I think you know, entering this conversation, I tended to favor more that we act irrationally than rationally. And, and you know what? Maybe that's just sort of coming out of the pandemic because I'm seeing a right. lot of examples of that. Right. I don't know. Um, but yeah, you you've given me a lot to think about. Um, it's, it is a murky subject though, isn't it? Like it's really yeah, hard it really to is. wade through because I just find it's, it is like going down a rabbit hole in many a, ways, very, right? Very large field, a lot of controversial theories in it. And, uh, calling something rational as a way of valorizing it, esteeming it and calling something irrational as a way of condemning it, criticizing it. This is and true. So I'm, I'm tempted to say of people from certain political pr- perspectives that they are irrational. But it's but I'm not using the term very precisely. I, yeah, I'm thinking they're making some kind of mistake, and I yeah. hope it's a mistake that I can show they're making objectively. So I would love to be able to put it under the term, you know, irrational or rational. But oh, just, I'm so glad you brought that up, Duncan, right? because you know what? I was thinking about that myself, and I thought, here we go, right back to the very beginning. We both agreed, or I agreed with you, I should say, that. Um, most people believe that they're acting rationally, right? right? So what good is it for for us or people to say to call to say to other people, you're acting irrationally. That is so irrational. What what good is that when they believe that they're acting rationally? If we want to persuade them perhaps to act in another way because we feel what they're making is a mistake, maybe it's a dangerous mistake, you know, we 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 need to do it in another way. To not, to not use irrational as being, um, denigrating, as being an insult, as being, you know, something negative. Right. I, I'm really glad you brought that up. Yeah, that's a really nice point. Suppose I'm trying to get somebody to change their mind about a political matter. The worst thing I could do is start with, you're being irrational. That, oh, yes. Why start calling Absolute. names, right? A, a, a better way to start would be, that's interesting. Why do you think that? Like, like what, 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 what's your justification? And people always have a justification. They always do. And then, and then start interrogating it a little bit. Um, really, what do you, I, I, but I read, you know, there's this other position. What do you say about that? Or it seems like that just can't be right. You know, and so just start reasoning, just start investigating, but in a sympathetic, empathetic way, in a way that allows the person to back out of it without having to admit that there was something wrong with them without having to lose face. When I have conversations with people, what I try to do is put the thing we disagree about on the table as a thing that exists independently of us. I do this with my students all the time. So, you know, who cares whose opinion it is? It's just an interesting opinion. Now let's see what's to be said for it and against it. No judgment, you know, no no horrible consequences. Let's just, and, and I can get away with that because in a university environment, this is what we do, right? This is the whole mm-hmm. point of the university education. It's one of the few times in your life when your ideas will be taken seriously and looked at generously, and you can find out what's to be said for them, for your culture, for your background assumptions. So I love this point that calling people irrational is not helpful, and it probably doesn't really express what you mean either. What you should really say is things like, man, your views frustrate me because I think I have really good evidence that they're false or that you've, or that there's something that they don't take account of or there's this other thing we need to think about, and then make the case. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. You Do know, you know what? Coffee, not shoots. <laughs> Oh my goodness. There, believe it or not, there was a lot of other ground I wanted to cover, but we weren't able to. But of course, you teach a whole course on this. So, and this is only, you know, 45 minutes. Um, let me ask you, what do you hope people come away with from our discussion? Like if, if you could say, gee, I, I hope this is the one point or, you know, two points that, that they got from our talk. What, what would that be? Uh, one of them would be the very last thing we talked about. When we use the words rational and irrational in a condemnatory way, are we advancing a debate? And the answer is probably no. So don't use those words then. <laughs> Try to approach, it, approach things another way. Uh, and the other thing is this, um, respect that there is such a thing as a whole body of knowledge about what counts as rational believing, rational desiring, rational acting that we can all learn from. 
it, it's a it's a subject that we can get better at, that we can learn from, that there's expertise on. Uh, so I guess there's a third thing uh, that I would hope people would take away from this, and it's something we didn't have time to talk about, but I'll just, so I'll just mention it briefly, maybe for another occasion. It used to be thought that a rational person decides on her own what's true. She interprets the evidence, she forms her beliefs. Uh, but it's now thought that people make better decisions, more rational decisions, if they form beliefs as part of a group. And there are a couple of reasons for this. Uh, one is, if, if you're in a group, everybody pools their expertise and they try to correct each other's mistakes. And, you know, many heads make a true review. There's another reason. Many of the things that we have to acquire beliefs about, like what's the best way to distribute resources, who deserves what, who deserves to be treated a certain way, are really discussions about how to distribute these resources. And the correct decision is one that we could all sign off on. So what you have to do is bring in all these interest groups to a table and they all contribute their interests. And so what makes what they say true about how to distribute resources is that they've in effect written a contract that is to everybody's advantage to agree to. So that would be a really obvious situation where you need the presence of a group. So I guess that would be the third thing that I think is that deserves some attention. I hope people take away. Yeah. From this. No, I, I am so glad you brought that up because, do you know, it, it and it makes sense to me um, because who wants to operate in a, in a vacuum, right? Just by oneself. We need yeah. other people. And I, I have to tell you that probably, well, so many interviews I've done. Um, whether it's about happiness, whether it's about uh, the, the workplace, meaningful relationships, et cetera, it is all about connecting to others, right? I mean, that's what Absolutely. we're all about. So, so the fact that it is it, it best in a rational decision to, to consult with others, I, I think that totally makes sense. Yeah. Thanks so much, Duncan. I totally love this conversation. It was great speaking with you. Me too, Mary. Great pleasure. That is Duncan McIntosh. He is a professor of philosophy at Dalhousie University in Halifax. And if you'd like to know more about his work, please check out our show notes. That is it for this edition of the Cram Podcast. We hope you enjoyed it and we would really appreciate your support. Please rate our podcast and subscribe and follow us on social. At Cram Ideas is our handle. Our thanks to the Temerty Foundation for their generous support. Thanks for listening. See you here next time.